Hey everyone, so today is a really exciting day because today is the day that I get to share with you all my thoughts on the new NVIDIA RTX 3080. We've all seen NVIDIA's announcement event and the hype surrounding these cards, but today we get to look at some benchmarks and see if it lives up to the hype. But first, let's remove this Activate Windows watermark with today's video sponsor, SCD Key. They offer cheap OEM Windows 10 keys, so just head over there using the link in the description down below. If you enter the discount code TPC at checkout, you'll save yourself an additional 15% off. The key is delivered immediately, and then you can just search for Activate on your PC and input the code there, click Activate, and the watermark is gone. So back to the video. So I have a Founders Edition RTX 3080 straight from NVIDIA. And this generation, NVIDIA has really made some unique decisions in terms of cooler and PCB design. The build quality is just as great as we've come to expect from Founders Edition cards. I was a big fan of the 20 series Founders, and my initial impression of the 30 series cooler is just as good. The cooler is very different to the previous one, but you can see that every decision has been made with cooling in mind. It's really heavy and feels really solid and is covered in exposed heatsink fins of different angles and density depending on the intended airflow direction. There's giant heat pipes running throughout the heatsink and the PCB has been designed specifically to fit this cooler and allow for the rear fan placement. The front fan intakes air and exhausts it straight out of the back of the case through the largest IO cutouts I've seen to date. This fan acts like the blower design coolers that we've seen in the past. The rear fan pulls air through the heatsink and exhausts it straight upwards. This approach to cooling makes a lot of sense, as rather than exhausting towards your side panel or towards the motherboard, which without good case airflow would be recycled, it just pushes it away from your GP area and toward the CPU cooler and the case's ventilation. It'll be interesting to see what this does to CPU temps, but we'll have to wait until direct comparisons are available between this card and third-party 3080s that will have different cooler designs. The Founders Edition features NVIDIA's new 12-pin power cable, although an adapter is included in the box that runs to two normal 8-pin connectors. Third-party cards from the likes of like Aorus and MSI won't be using this 12-pin connector though. I think that this 12-pin adapter is going to irritate me to begin with because it will look messy, but then once I'm able to replace it with a custom sleeve cable, I imagine they'll actually prefer it to having two 8-pins on the card, as I think a single cable will look cleaner than multiple 8-pins do, especially as the connector is much smaller. One thing that once seen, you're kind of unable to unsee, is that the 8 in the 3080 has been etched upside down compared to how it's written on the box and on every other 3080 model. But even with that typo, I'm hearing a lot of people say that this is the best looking 3080 cooler design and that this is the one people want the most. And I can't say I blame them. If anything, this car design is even more impressive in person than it is in photos. So the 3080 Founders Edition is powered by NVIDIA's new Ampere architecture and has 8,704 CUDA cores, a base clock of 1.44 GHz and a boost clock of 1.71 GHz. It has 10 GB of GDDR6X memory at 9.5 GHz with a 320-bit memory bus and it features 68 second-generation ray tracing cores and 272 third-generation tensor cores. So the build that I'm going to be using to test with today is Lotus, which is my Ryzen 9 3900X workstation PC. Now normally I don't game on this PC, but I am going to today as I thought you'd prefer to see me test the 3080 in an AMD rig. The full specs of this build will be in the description down below, as well as links to other videos if you want to see Lotus being built. So one of the unique things about Lotus is the airflow design. It has two giant 200mm Noctua fans intaking in the floor, and two giant 200mm Noctua fans exhausting out of the roof, with the CPU cooler rotated 90 degrees in order to match the case's airflow, creating a like giant chimney or wind tunnel. So the 2070 Super that's been in the build up until now has been mounted vertically, but for testing in this video, I'm going to have the GPU mounted directly into the PCIe slot. Interestingly, this actually places the 3080's airflow in line with the rest of the builds, as the two bottom case intake fans will blow air directly at the face of the GPU, and the exhaust location may actually result in most of the GPU's heat avoiding the CPU cooler. So for comparison, I'm going to bring out my RTX 2080 Ti for a head-to-head -head battle between Turing's flagship and Ampere's flagship, However, it is worth remembering the huge price difference between these two cards. 
So I'm going to be testing everything exclusively in 4K in this video, since that's just how I game. Um, so let's start with some non-RTX games to begin with. So starting with this year's, but can it run crisis title, Microsoft Flight Simulator. On the 2080 Ti, this runs at an average frame rate of 39 FPS. Now, I wasn't expecting a huge FPS increase, since this game only utilises 4 of the 3900X's 12 cores, so I thought that the CPU would be a limiting factor here. But no, the 3080 saw frame rates hit an average of 50 FPS. This is the only game benchmarked in this video that I can say that I'd be happy to play at 30 FPS, so 50 FPS and ultra settings is a very nice result. Next, I tested Gears of War 5, with the Ultra preset and HD textures installed. The 2080 Ti performed well here, just falling shy of that sweet 60fps average, but the upgrade to the RTX 3080 gives a 33.2% performance increase to your FPS, which also raises the 1% lows to about 60fps. Next up is Far Cry New Dawn. Here, the performance increase wasn't as great, just an 18.8% .8 increase over the 2080 Ti. Well, I say just, but you have to remember that we're comparing a £650 GPU to what was a £1,200 card. What I'm most interested in here is to see where the 3070 will sit in between, because the gap isn't very big, but perhaps I'm CPU limited here. Moving on to Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I ran this game on the Ultra preset with the HD texture pack on. In hindsight, this was perhaps a tad over ambitious, and most people playing this title would drop down the settings a little when playing it in 4K. The 2080 Ti managed an average of 47 FPS, and the 3080 fell just below 60. Next, I tested Forza Horizon 4. This game looks great and runs great, with both cards having no problems averaging high frame rates that are completely wasted on my 60Hz display. The 3080 performed 26% faster than the 2080 Ti, but it is worth pointing out that the CPU was the limiting factor here. Lastly, for this round of non-RTX games was Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. This is on the Ultra preset, with the resolution scaling increased to 1 rather than the 0.5 it's set to by default. If any of you out there play competitive shooters, perhaps it's finally time to make the jump from 1440p to 4K. So now it's time to see how the 3080 performs in some RTX titles, starting with Control, since it's easily one of the most impressive RTX implementations. This is a DLSS 2.0 game, and when played in 4K, defaults DLSS to performance mode. First, I tested it native 4K. No one would actually game like this in Control, but I wanted to add it in as a baseline. Next, I tested with DLSS, with the render resolution set to both 1080p and 1440p. As you can see, with the 2080 Ti, if you want to play with maximum settings, you need to have DLSS set to 1080p to average above 60fps. However, upgrading to the 3080 allows you to average above 60fps with DLSS at 1440p instead. That being said, I can only notice a difference between 1080p DLSS and 1440p DLSS if I really, really look for it, like in actual gaming, I can't tell the difference at all. So I personally stick with the render resolution of 1080p and increase my 1% lows to 60 for a smoother experience. DLSS has come a long way since it was first introduced to the market with the 20 series. It's actually surprisingly good now. And I know there's some of you out there that feel like native resolution is the only way to go, but genuinely give it a shot. You might be surprised. Next up is Wolfenstein Youngblood. This is on max settings with DLSS 2.0 set to quality mode. Halfway through testing, I learnt of a beta build of this game that had been optimised for the 30 series, so I tested on that as well. This yielded a 3fps increase for the 3080. I was expecting more, but I guess it's a good sign that developers are still improving the performance in games for new hardware. The difference between the 2080 Ti and the 3080 in this game was huge, with the 3080 giving a 47% increase in average frame rate with just RTX on. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, I learned my lesson from Assassin's Creed Odyssey here and ran the game on the high preset instead of Ultra. The 2080 Ti struggled without DLSS, but managed to average above 60fps with it on. The 3080 gave a 33% increase to average frame rate with RTX on, and a 23% increase with RTX and DLSS. Lastly, for my RTX testing, I tested Metro Exodus and Modern Warfare. In Modern Warfare, which doesn't feature DLSS, 
I saw a 32% performance increase with the 3080. This is the game on its high settings, so it's fair to say that here, the 2080 Ti could be a 4K60 card if you work with the settings a little, whereas the 3080 manages it without needing any work at all. And then I tested Metro Exodus in ultra quality with ultra ray tracing. The 3080 provided a 40% increase to FPS over the 2080 Ti in average frame rate with just RTX on. However, as was the case with three of the four DLSS titles benchmarked in this video, the performance gains with DLSS on weren't as impressive. Further testing would be required to isolate if this is down to GPU performance or if it's because performance is more CPU bound at these higher frame rates. So rounding up all of the comparisons made in this video, the biggest improvements in performance in comparisons of 2080 Ti are to be had when gaming in native 4K with RTX on. If you've held on to a 1080 Ti, I imagine you're really happy to see these kind of improvements over the card that you skipped. And if you have a 2080 Ti, upgrading isn't at all necessary for a decent gaming experience, and I do think that upgrading every other generation is the way to go, but if you do decide to upgrade, chances are even with the reduced resale value of your card, the upgrade to the 3080 will almost certainly cost you less than the upgrade to the 2080 Ti did. In terms of clock speed, I found that the card ran anywhere from 1830MHz to 1905MHz, with it averaging at 1860 And as for power draw, the total system power draw whilst playing control was 473 watts, and then running stress tests that pinned my CPU and GPU to 100%, it increased to a maximum of 564 watts. So a 750 watt power supply would be my recommendation for a build like this, but you could probably manage just fine on a 650 watt high quality power supply. So talking about the Founders Edition cooler some more, whilst I don't have an aftermarket 3080 to compare to, I think with this generation, the likes of you know MSI, Asus, Sayoris, etc., are going to have a harder time beating the Founders. Not only do I think this card is potentially the best looking card this generation, but the cooler performs really well as well. In terms of noise, this is the quietest Lotus has ever been. The 3080 Founders Edition has a zero RPM fan mode, whereas my 2070 Super and 2080 Ti's don't. The large exposed heat sink fins help to dissipate heat whilst in this mode. Then when the fans do come on, it's still one of the quietest air-cooled cards I've ever owned, and this is on a 320 watt TGP card. I have noticed that my bedroom gets hotter quicker though, so that heat is still a potential issue, but not for the cooler as it handles it very well. So one thing I know people will be asking me is how it performs in Lotus, with its vertical airflow design. Unfortunately, it turns out that the bottom CPU cooler fan does intake some of that warm air. I can actually feel this just by waving my hand over the CPU cooler exhaust. The left side is cool and the right side is noticeably warmer. As I don't have any temperature probes, I tried to make a picture in Photoshop of what I can feel. So, I've devised a quick experiment. I created an airflow barrier with a piece of cardboard bent at the bottom so that the CPU intake fan would have to get its air from somewhere other than the GPU exhaust. With all my case and CPU fans at 100%, while standing in an alleyway in Modern Warfare, I saw my 3900X drop from 66.4 degrees to 59.1 degrees. That's a 7.3 degrees drop in CPU temperature. And this is with no real difference to CPU clock speed or GPU clock speed temperature and fan speed. I then lowered my case fan to their medium setting and fixed the CPU cooler to 50% and ran the same test again. This time I saw a 5.3 degree difference in CPU temps. Now, I don't know what anyone else is going to say in their reviews, but I do worry that the public impression will be that the Founders Edition heats up your CPU. However, and I know I'm only like scratching the surface here when it comes to testing, but I think it would be wrong to assume that a conventional GPU's cooler heat entirely avoids your CPU cooler. With the 2080 Ti in this build, for example, much of its heat is still going to go straight through the CPU cooler, um, and the same is probably true, but to a lesser extent, in a build with a conventional layout. But the thing that I actually really love about the 3080 Founders Edition cooler is that the heat exhaust is just so directable. Like, I like to have full control over the airflow of my builds, and where a normal cooler dumps that heat into your case, just all over the place, with the 3080 Founders, I know where most of the heat is coming from, and then I can therefore control where it goes from there.
And I'm thinking with this build, we're assuming it keeps the 38 founders, of 3D printing some sort of chimney for it. I think that would work really well. Although in like a modded build with the right theme, that would look so cool. <laughs> but for like simplicity's sake, a small rectangle of clear acrylic bent and attached to this bottom fan would probably work just fine. So it's conclusion time. And the point in the video where I answer the question, is the NVIDIA RTX 3080 Founders Edition tasty? Well, let me start by saying that if I didn't have this one, I would be ordering one on the 17th. In fact, I have this and I'm still thinking of ordering another one. Like when I first tested the 2080 Ti, I said that it performed really well, but that I just couldn't justify spending the asking price on one and that I wouldn't recommend anyone else do it either especially with the RT cores and tensor cores having such limited usability. Whereas with the 3080, we have a significantly more powerful card at a significantly lower price. And I'd go as far as to say that this would be a fair price if it was a GTX 3080 and didn't have any of the ray tracing stuff on it. But it does. So you no longer have to feel like you're paying significantly more money for experimental technology. The Founders Edition cooler is extremely well built for its £650 asking price and any manufacturer that wants to charge more than that best have some very good reasons. With all that said, there's two reservations that I have that stop me from being able to give this card my fullest recommendation. The first lies with AMD. They have an event coming shortly which will hopefully reveal the GPUs they're bringing to market to compete. And the other reservation lies with Nvidia themselves. I think it's safe to assume that we're going to see new additions to the 30 series lineup, perhaps even a full mid-generation refresh. And my prediction is, is that Nvidia is going to save the TI branding for those cards, ditching the potentially confusing super branding that was used last gen. So a potential 3080 Ti could be like a boosted 3080 or a cut down 3090, and either way would very likely carry more than the 10 gig of VRAM that this 3080 has. So the big question everyone needs to ask themselves is should they buy a 3080 now or wait to see what's around the corner? And personally, I'd be buying a 3080 on launch day and securing my epic 4K gaming setup for the upcoming Cyberpunk 2077. But that's just what I do personally. So for that reason, I'm going to say that the new NVIDIA RTX 3080 is one tasty GPE. So if you like this video, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and you want to see more of my videos. You can follow me on Twitter to see what videos I'm working on and updates between them. Thank you so much to my incredible patrons for supporting this channel. And thank you all for watching.